now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. An episode of Counter Spy, Espionage, uh, starring Mandel Kramer and Don McLaughlin. This episode was originally broadcast August 11, 1949, over ABC. The Case of the Murmured Millions. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. United States counter spies, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of the murmured millions. Another counter-spy report to the American people, brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi-Cola. And now, to counter-spy. Hello? Oh, yeah, Tony. With the same guy? Boy, that little two-timing. Where are you now? Oh, downstairs in the lobby. Is she on her way up? No, no, you don't have to tailor anymore. I got enough for a nice big burn. Okay, ring off. Danes, I want I learn you. Hello, Rocky. I got something I want to talk to you about. Me first, Dud. I got something I want to give you. Well, it's about time I've been due for... You've been due for this for a long time. Rocky! Uh, oh, babe, makes a jerk out of Rocky. Done. Oh, Rocky, don't! Time and me for a two-bit corn man. Oh, stop it, Rocky. Stop it, I tell you. Don't tell me nothing. I know it all. Nobody pulls the wool over Rocky's eyes. Oh, oh. He's good, this guy, Norman. Is that worth taking a beating for? <laughs> He's that good at playing around? Oh, no, Rocky, no, please. Please, this was business strictly business. You know what I think of that kind of business? Oh, It's for you I did it. He wants to meet you and his me. That's good. That's really good. He wants to meet me, so he plays footsie with my dog. <laughs> Why don't he come up here? I got an address. Oh, no, Rocky. Will you listen, please? No more. Okay, I got time. Speak your piece once and good. Because then I'm going to kick your teeth. Oh, listen, he wants to see you. We've got a proposition. I was going to set up a date when you started... Stop the fairy tale, Dodd. I looked him up. He's a con man, a lone wolf. What does he want from me? He's got a deal. He needs your syndicate behind. A big one. Yeah. He wants me to bring you to him two o'clock this afternoon. A beach on the south shore of Long Island. A beach? Yeah. He don't want to take no chance on anybody overhearing. Oh, sharp cookie, huh? Oh, Rocky. Rocky, you believe me, don't you? Maybe yes, maybe no. But we'll keep that date. Yeah, I like that beach idea. Oh. Because if this ain't level, Dodd, I'll see that you and the boyfriend go for a long swim. One way. That's him, Rocky, down on the beach. Come on. Yeah, sure. Hello, Mr. Norman. Hello, Dorothy. Rocky, this is Bill Norman. Bill? Rocky down. Hiya. How do you do? Well, let's hear your story, Norman, and it better be good. I ain't in the habit of being dragged 50 miles from nowhere just to talk to a guy. All right, Mr. Dunn. Uh, Dorothy, would you mind taking a walk? Look, what? fella, that's part of my business. This is level, and anything you tell me, I'll tell her anyhow. That's perfectly all right with me. I just don't want her to hear what we say. What kind of sense does that make? Simple. If anything should go wrong and we should be arrested, always a possibility... You could testify only to what you heard, not what Rocky told you, I Do think. Do you think that no, I would... No, not at all, Dorothy, not at all. I just don't like to take chances. Smart character. I'm getting in a rest. Go on, Doc, take a watch. Okay. All right, Norman, start talking. Well, first you'd like to know a little bit about me, wouldn't you? No, I've been doing a little checking. 
William Norman, alias Walter Nolan, con man, swindler, three to five years stretch in the Harrisville pen, here at Cluton Prison, and strictly a lone wolf in operation. Oh, pretty complete. Yeah. Now, what's the pitch? Five to ten million dollars a year, net. Big pitch. You're interested? I've got a catcher's mitt start throwing. It's a refinement of the protection racket. Protection? <laughs> I got out of that in the 30s. It's too risky. The cops and the good citizens get mad fast. This isn't risky. I don't like to take chances. That's why I met you out here on the beach. You can't wire the air and the sea. Cute. What do you want from me? I'm not forgetting you. Got a rep as a lone wolf. And I'd keep it. Except that now I need your organization. Why? You've got men in most of the big cities in the country, haven't you? That's right. It takes a big outfit to run a gambling operation, and they're tough enough to run any protection racket ever invented. There'll be no violence at all attached to this. I don't like force. You can make more with brains. What do the boys do, then? Wreck a $20 million corporation. $20 million. For that, you need an army. <laughs> Not if you do it with words instead of violence. You still interested? Yeah, I always like to hear a guy talk in millions. What's the name of this outfit we're going to wreck? We? In already? Could be. If the setup's as sure as you are of yourself. <laughs> it is. The name of the outfit is the Double Circle Products Corporation. Oh. Now you just sit down and be comfortable. And I'll tell you how Mr. Blake, the president of Double Circle, is going to help us turn a murmur into millions. Mr. Norman, you've got five minutes of my time. Make it brief and to the point. I'm a busy man. All right, Mr. Blake. I'm here to sell you the services of my organization, Norman Associates Public Relations. Five years too late. I already have a public relations agent. Right, Mr. Blake. But they go after the press, radio, mediums of mass communication. I go directly to the people themselves. Well, that's not very clear. Your products go into practically every American home. Suppose the public should get the idea that Double Circle merchandise is inferior. What? Possibly dangerous. And start talking about it. You could lose a lot of business. Nonsense. There's not a thing wrong with Double Circle products, and there never will be. You've got nothing to sell, Mr. Norman. And you've wasted enough of my time already. I'm satisfied with my present public relations. I was afraid you'd say that, Mr. Blake. I'm sorry, because I offer my services only once. I assure you that's been enough, Mr. Norman. <laughs> I'd like you to remember that, Mr. Blake, just in case anything should happen to your concern. Hello, Dorothy. Uh, n n no, no, no last names, please. Will you tell our mutual friend to put our plan into operation? Yeah. Just as I outlined. Subways, railroad stations, ferries, wherever people gather. That's right. I'll keep in touch with you. Goodbye. Uh, these subways are getting more crowded every day. Yeah. Are your wife any better, Tony? Worse, Mike. Hands are all burnt and blistered. <laughs> Doctor says it was that stuff she was using made by the Double Circle Company. Oh, bad, huh? Well, you saw what it did to her hands. We'll never buy Double Circle again. Mabel, did you hear that? Double Circle? I bought some of that junk myself. Hello, Jeff. Where's the wife? Thought she was going to the theater with us. Ah, she can't. She got some kind of metal poison and using that, that Double Circle product. I'm going to sue that company. Yeah, arsenic. And the stuff was made by Double Circle. I heard it from the man whose wife was poisoned. Don't try to sell me double circle. I'm no dope. Jane, take my advice. Don't go near that double circle stuff. It's poison. Double circle? Sure, it's good. If you want to drop dead quick. I wouldn't buy double circle, not if they gave me the company. You hear about double circle products? They ought to be sued for selling them. It's poison. If you want to drop dead quick. I won't buy double circle. They ought to be sued. It's poison, that's all poison. <laughs> Blake speaking. What is it? More cancellations? From where now? The West Coast. Look, we've simply got to put more pressure on our salesmen. 
I know, I know all about the rumors. We're spending every cent we can to combat them, but we can't keep it up in the face of these cancellations. Two more weeks and we'll be forced to sell out. From Federal Securities Commission to David Harding, Chief, United States Counter Spies. Request preliminary investigation into failure of Double Circle Products Corporation. Stockholders' loss enormous. Evidence of malfeasance or fraud should be forwarded to us for prosecution. Four months, Mr. Harding, that's all. Four months and a $20 million business practically wiped out. We just have to sell with cancellations outnumbering orders by four to one. Oh, Mr. Blake, about those rumors about your product... They're not true. They never were true, and they're not true today. We know that, Mr. Blake. They couldn't be. The federal trade laws protect consumers against the sale of anything harmful. Well, I wish more people were aware of that, Mr. Peters. Well, nevertheless, Mr. Blake, rumors have to spring from someplace. Now, have you any idea at all how they started? I've been thinking about that. Your competitors? Mr. Peters, free enterprise is a competitive system, but there are rules and ethics. Every one of my competitors offered to help me weather this, but it was no use. Well, then what were you thinking, Mr. Blake? Oh, what's the use? You can't arrest a rumor. If it's criminal slander and you can prove who started it, you can. Prove? I can't prove anything. But you suspect something, Mr. Blake. I do, Mr. Peters. Well, then we'd like to know those suspicions. All right, Mr. Harding. I'll give you my suspicions in one name. William Norman. Norman? Yes, he runs an outfit called Norman Associates, Public Relations. He predicted this might happen when he tried to sell me his services. Oh, a profit, huh? A very pointed profit, because he underscored his prediction. Well, when the rumors started, did you try to get in touch with him? Well, well, not at first, Mr. Peters, but later on I did. In fact, I offered to retain his services to see if that would stop the rumors. But he wasn't for hire then, was he? How did you know, Mr. Hardy? Well, he'd have been stupid if he had been. It's easy enough to start gossip, but almost impossible to stop it. I suppose this Norman did start those rumors, Chief. It'll be just as impossible to prove it, won't it? Well, perhaps, perhaps not. But before we jump to any conclusions, I'll want to know more about William Norman. Well, my secretary has his address and phone number, Mr. Harding. I get it, Peters. And put Norman's name through the works. I want to know everything about him, from the day he was born until the day you hand me your report. August 11th, 1949, Counter Spy on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care, especially now with inflation the way it is. People are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch. It's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. It's just a different experience, and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills, and it's been going strong for over 25 years. It really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in health care sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and Find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number, 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Counter Spy, August 11th, 1949, the case of the Murmured Millions. Now back to Counter Spy. Bill Norman, the Immaculate Racketeer has just put his proposition to another important businessman. Mr. Norman, it's simply no use. This company is satisfied with its present public relations setup. Mm-hmm. Funny. That's the same thing Mr. Blake said to me. Blake? Hmm. The Double Circle Corporation. You read about their failure and forced sale, I imagine? Yes, I did. Uh, he might have forestalled all those nasty rumors if he'd employed the services of an alert public relations agency like mine. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure I like what you're saying. Oh, I'm not saying anything. I'm just trying to sell you. Make your sales point a little clearer. I uh, don't like talking business in offices. Suppose we go for a drive. I have my car downstairs. Suppose I don't. Well, it's a free country. Do as you choose. Blake did. Yes. I hope you don't have the same difficulties. Good day. Wait a minute. I think I will go for that drive. <laughs> Wise decision. I want to see all your cards. I'd be glad to show them to you. As long as there are no kibitzers around. Let's go, Mr. Sanford. All right, Mr. Norman. Let's 
serve your proposition. Not here, Mr. Sanford. I even suspect my own car. Someone may have wired it. We just go for a little walk in this field by the road and then talk. Hmm? Whatever you say. What the... What are you doing? Just making sure you're not concealing anything. What do you mean? I once made a record unwittingly. Concealed microphone. They played it in court. Liked my voice so much, they gave me a year's engagement in a penitentiary. I don't want a return date. Well, now you're becoming candid. I'll do even better. I'll become blunt. The rumors that caused the failure of the Double Circle Corporation. I started them and spread them. That's quite an admission. Mm. Isn't it? Suppose I repeated it to the authorities. <laughs> we have no witnesses. I'd simply deny it and then sue you for slander and defamation of character, on top of which rumors about your products would start. And with what your company sells, think of the pleasant tales I could invent. Just a dressed-up version of the protection record, huh? Well put, Mr. Sanford. Only you protect yourself against words instead of violence. And how much would this cost the corporation? One percent of your gross business. One percent? Are you crazy? We do nearly $50 million a year. I know. That's what makes one percent so reasonable for my kind of public relations. Half a million dollars? Well, I can't say yes or no just like that. You can't say no, but I'll give you time to figure out a way to say yes. Call me the first of the week. We'll go for another drive and complete our business. <laughs> Report on William Norman. Complete. From the day of his birth, September 12, 1911, up to and including yesterday when he called on Colton Sanford of the Sanford Beauty Corporation. Sanford. Any of our agents seen Sanford yet? No, not yet. Well, then we will. I want to find out what Norman said to him. Well, now, what about Norman's background? Well, he served time in two state penitentiaries. It would have been more except he's had good lawyers. He's been a confidence man from the age of 22. And suddenly he blossoms out into a public relations expert. Blake had a good foundation for his suspicions. Yes, Dave, but he was right about proof. There's not a thing to connect Norman with the rumors that ruined Double Circle unless we tried to trace them back. Oh, impossible. We'd be licked before we start. Besides, even if through some miracle we did trace them to Norman, it wouldn't prove a thing. He'd just say he heard them somewhere else. Now, our best bet is to start at the source. Interview Sanford. Find out what Norman told him. Okay, Chief, but... Norman would hardly admit to Sanford that he was the cause of Blake's bankruptcy. All wrong, Peters. If what we suspect is true, Norman had to admit it. What do you mean? Well, that's the flaw in any protection racket. The crook has to reveal himself to his victim in order to extort money. Nobody'd pay off otherwise. Now, our job is to get Norman to reveal himself in the presence of a witness or a microphone well hidden. And Mr. Sanford is going to help us do just that. <laughs> That's right, Mr. Harding. You and Mr. Peters have reconstructed the whole picture. Norman definitely admitted he did the Blake job. Admitted he boasted about it. But if you've got any idea about my testifying in court, forget it. It'd be my word against his, and you couldn't convict him without supporting evidence. Well, if we got that supporting evidence, you'd testify, wouldn't you, Mr. Sanford? With pleasure. But how are you going to get it? I've told you Norman won't talk with a third party around. I told you about his searching me. Yeah, Norman sounds even smarter than his record indicates. Well, perhaps too smart, Peters. Mr. Sanford, yes. you say Norman didn't start talking until you were well away from his car. That's right. He wasn't taking any chances on eavesdroppers. When you meet him again, it's supposed to be the same setup, huh? Yes. Same place? Well, I don't know. The last time we drove around, he just seemed to stop at the first convenient country field. Well, that gives us no chance at all to stake out microphones and recorders. Maybe we can do it another way. Well, how, Mr. Harding? You want proof that will stand up in court. The only way you'll get it is from Norman's own lips. Right, Mr. Sanford. That's just where I intend to get it. When are you supposed to meet him? The next two or three days. I call him to set the time. Okay. Make sure it's daylight. And as for the date, uh, Peters, call the Meteorological Bureau in Washington. Tell them to give you as positive a forecast as they can on the weather for the next three days. Now, Mr. Sanford. Yes, sir. You'll meet Norman on the nicest day of the three. Well, what are you going to do, Mr. Hart? Just what you suggested. Convict Norman from his own lips. <laughs> Certainly picked peculiar places to meet, Mr. Norman. What's wrong with the beach? Pleasant breeze, nice surroundings. You think of a better place to do business? You've got a point. 
If we do business, do we? Look, how do I know you're not just cashing in on Blake's bad luck? Maybe you had nothing to do with the rumors that ruined him. After all, a rumor campaign like that would take a lot of men and money, a big organization. You're right, Mr. Zanthor. And I've got an organization behind me. One of the biggest syndicates in the country. The syndicate of Rocky Dunn. Rocky Dunn? I see you read the papers. Well, I give the word, and in two hours, his men will be spreading rumors across the country about every product you make. Now, you pay off, or do I give the word? I'd still like more proof. Okay. No, wait a minute. Don't go. I don't like to waste my time. I know how rumors can spread. Every now and then, from nowhere, comes the rumor that some famous person is dead. So? Let's pick a name. Say, Bert Clancy, the baseball player. He's in good health. If I hear he's dead from some public source, then we can do business. <laughs> That's not bad, Mr. Sanford. In fact, it's good enough for me to file for future use. Then it's a deal? Yeah. And when you hear Clancy's dead, call me. I'll come around to collect my first quarterly retainer. From August 11th, 1949, Counterspy here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion, along with Bob and Ray, followed these important words. Whether you're taking your pets on the road or a walk around the block, you need to be aware of heat stroke. Hi, I am Dr. Jose Arce, immediate past president of the American Veterinary Medical Association. It's important that pets get out and enjoy the warm weather and fresh air. But here are some reminders to help keep your pets safe in the heat. Tune into the day's forecast to see how hot it will be. Limit exercise on hot days or schedule walks earlier or later on the day when it's cooler. If outside, stay on the grass instead of the hot pavement. Make sure your pet has unlimited fresh water and access to shade. Never leave your pet in a closed vehicle and leave your pet at home in air conditioning when you go out. If you see signs of heat strokes in your pet, such as excessive panting, drooling, unsteadiness or abnormal gum and tongue color, call your veterinarian or nearest emergency clinic. For more info on summer pet safety, visit avma.org. That's avma.org. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Counter Spy and the Case of the Murmured Millions from August 11th, 1949. Mr. Norman? Yes? This is Colton Sanford. I just heard a rumor that Bert Clancy died. So did I. Funny how those things start, isn't it? Isn't it? Incidentally, we've decided to retain your firm for public relations. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. If you'll drop around our conference room in about an hour, our vice president in charge of personnel will outline the company policies. Oh? And, of course, give you your first quarterly retainer. Splendid. I'll be very interested in learning the company policy. One hour, then. Goodbye. <laughs> Right in here, Mr. Norman. I'm sorry Mr. Sanford was called away. He left a note about the retainer, I know. Oh, naturally. We'll pick it up in accounting. After you've seen the orientation film, we like to show all new executives. Well, let's get to it then. Of course. Oh, this is Mr. Thurman. He'll run the projector and interpret. Hello? How do you do? Or shall we start? Well, I'm expecting to... Oh, that must be the excuse me. Come in. After you, Rocky. Now, listen, I don't want to... Mr. Dunn. You know each other? Why, he, yes, yes, but uh, I wasn't aware that Mr. Dunn was connected with your company. I thought he was connected with your firm. Hey, what is this double talk? Don't you know who this guy is, Norman? I don't think I got the name. I didn't give it, but it's Harding, David Harding. The counter spies, Norman. It's some kind of a pinch. Keep quiet, Mr. Dunn. I'm sure Mr. Harding will explain the meaning of this himself. With pleasure. But first, I'd like you to look at some moving pictures, Mr. Norman. Peters, will you turn out the lights and stay with Rocky? Right, sir. Thurman, start the projector. Yes, sir. Recognize yourself, Mr. Norman? Yes. I must say I photograph better than Mr. Sanford. Hey, look, I don't... Quiet, Rocky. I thought silent pictures were passe. Well, not always. Notice this next shot. 
The way the camera zooms in for a close-up. Telephoto lens. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Now, this is all very interesting. Is there any point? Definitely, Mr. Norman. I'm arresting you for extortion, criminal slander, and whatever other counts we can dig up against you. On the basis of this film? Yes. <laughs> it's silent, Mr. Harding. I was discussing legitimate business with Mr. Sanford when you took them. And if he says different, he's a liar. The pictures say different. You'll notice how Mr. Sanford kept moving around to keep your face toward one of our cameras. That had a purpose. Ah, uh, I don't bluff easy, Mr. Hart. You don't have to. I told you Mr. Thurman was the interpreter. Uh, what's Norman saying on the screen now, Thurman? I've got an organization behind me. One of the biggest syndicates in the country. The syndicate of Rocky Dunn. What? That's how we picked Rocky up. Smart guy, huh, Norman? You blabbering little no Hold Hold him, Peter. Cut it, Rocky. I'll show you. You Cut fool, it. don't you see? It's a trick. I think I'll wrap for it, Rocky. Oh. Rocky always had a reputation for a quick trigger temper. Now, look here, Mr. Hardy. Well, why don't you give it up, Norman? Mr. Thurman is a lip reader. Lip reader? Yes, and he'll appear in court, together with a dozen other expert lip readers, to testify to every word you said. On top of which, we've got Rocky in as a pickup order out for his girlfriend, Dot, to round out our kids. Lip reader? That's right, Norman. Come on, Peters, let's get him to headquarters. Looks like that's the only way we'll convince him this arrest is not a rumor, but a fact. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday, same time, same station to Counter Spy. Listen next Tuesday for the exciting Counter Spy case of the Statue of Death. The silky coated carrier that outsmarted an electric eye, the gift of appreciation that caused the death of an innocent woman, and the clicking guardian that halted two international agents who carried molecules of murder. Be sure to be tuned in next Tuesday to the case of the Statue of Death. On Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by William M. Sweets, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer, with music by Rosa Rio. Counter Spy is a Philip H. Lord production for Pepsi Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi, ice cold tonight. From August 11th, 1949, Counter Spy on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, here's Bob and Ray, August 11th, 1959. And now from coast to coast, Bob Elliott and Ray Golding present the CBS Radio Network. again, everybody. Welcome back to the old ranch. Old Bob and Ray Sun Farm here. Pleasant day this has been. Yeah, wonderful day to sit on the back porch and more or less watch the uh, the summer, summer slowly disappear. Slowly disappear, yeah. And it is. Yep. Only not so slowly. That's right. Bob uh, and uh, those of you listening, uh, we have a very important offer that I'd like to take time to start right now. This will only take a minute or so out of the program, but it's something I think uh, you should all hear. That's right. It's a deal that comes along once in a lifetime, and we decided to <clears throat> tell you about it right now. Now, usually this is something we don't do, but it's an offer that you, the listener, cannot afford to pass up. All right. First of all, uh, I want you to write down this number. The number to call is Pickering 6. If you get a busy signal, call back. Remember that number now. That's Pickering 6. Now, all you want to do is look at it. Buy nothing. Keep it for 10 days, and if you're not satisfied, return it, and you'll get your money back. Remember, nothing to buy. Call to our operators who are standing by. will not place you under any obligation. To Nor will it bring salesmen knocking at your door. Remember, nothing to buy. But we feel confident that once you see it and compare it to the old outmoded one, you now have... You'll really go for it. And listen to this. Nothing to buy. And under our plan, we estimate a savings of anywhere from 10 to $14 a month. Why not put that good money to use? That's right. Why not plunge that savings of 10 to $14 a month back into our plan? It's as easy as this. When the man on the truck delivers it, ask him to stand by. Now, once it's through your door and in your home, 
Kick it, push it, slam it, pour water over it if you like. And if you don't think it's going to keep you happy. If you don't think its features will give you increased freedom around the house. If you don't think it will save you costly bills. Or if it doesn't in every way live up to what we've said about it. Tell the truck driver to take it right out of your home. Tell him to put it back on the truck and drive it back to where it came from. Our factory in Hillsdale. We won't care because it's your law. And remember, nothing to buy. Or, if you prefer, our auditors have made possible and available the B plan. Which allows you to purchase it with a nominal down payment. The balance payable on the Big Brother plan. And remember, nothing to buy. Ladies and gentlemen, we feel we've said enough about this amazing plan. Right, there's nothing further we can say that will convince you. The product sells itself. Why not call our anxious operators at Pickering 6 right now and get in on the bargain of a lifetime? Get one today. Remember, if there were anything to buy, it would be a good buy. And the number to call, Pickering 6. Or simply drop a card to Goodbye CBS. 485 Madison Avenue, New York, and say, I want it. That's goodbye, CBS, 485 Madison Avenue, New York. And from New York, welcome to the After Hour television show starring Hack Park and myself, Eustace Dove. Now the star of our show, Hack Park. Hello out there. Uh, listening to that applause, either I'm better than I thought, or there are three or four hundred masseurs at work in the audience. Uh, Eustace, uh, who's our first guest tonight? Well, Hack, it's the secretary of uh, him. Well, Hack, uh, we tried getting you for the show, but oh. uh, you know how you are. You go right home and you never go out and all that stuff. I bet you've only been to a nightclub maybe once in the past three years. Well, I get sentimental and cry when I see a bill laid in front of me on a table. Hack, forgive me, but uh, before the secretary comes on, I'd like to say something. Go, go ahead, Eustace. Well, everything Hack says is true. Along with his natural flippancy, there's a tendency in his part to be, well, good, I suppose. Go ahead, Eustace. The secretary can wait. Go ahead. Well, Hack, people have asked me what Hack Park is really like, and... Uh, you see, Hack, you're so many people. Well, I have to be. There's so much to do around here, and I have to be so many people to look after all the details. And thus far, uh, what, have, what I've done here has been incredible. I mean that, Eustace. I know you do, Hack. And uh, that's part of it. But the thing that... Uh, Excuse me, Eustace. Folks, about Eustace. Most of you out there don't know this, but Eustace is seldom wrong. Oh, Hack. No, no, uh, look, I mean that, Eustace. Most people do not know how right you are. Well, and I'll tell you something else about Eustace, who's part of our family here. He's been to my home, and he's seen a lot. Uh, Hack is right about that. I might tell you that I was moved by what I saw, and so was Hack. What most people don't know is that Hack is a man who is easily moved. When I was there, Hack was, well, it wasn't a crying jag or anything like that. Uh, tell them uh, why I was moved, Eustace. Well, I don't know if you folks out there know this, but there's a stream that runs adjacent to Jack's house. Well, I like streams. They're nice. Anyhow, about six months ago, there was this crab. I, I suppose it came from the stream. And it crawled into Hack's home. Oh, that was a wild night. Wild! And wouldn't you know, that crab crawled into one of Hack's best suits. And the marvelous thing about it, Hack continued to wear the suit crab and all. Now, very few people know that. Well, uh, look, look, I make no pretense. I'm flooded with sentiment. Uh, people have asked me why, and I just tell them it's part of my fabulous way. Am I going to lie? Heck, you make it sound simple because it comes easy to you. There's very few people who would walk around with a crab in their suit. Well, thank you, Eustace. Uh, you know what, uh, what you're talking about. Now, uh, let's bring out the secretary. Uh, oh, here he is now. Hack, I'm glad to be here, and I come to this program with an offer. I have been empowered by the powers that be to ask wait, wait, you... Wait, wait just a minute, dear heart. Are you about to offer me a high government post? Why, yes, I... Well, that's sweet, but uh, I never leave my house except for this uh, nightly aggravation here. I tell you what, why don't you give the post to Eustace? He knows a great deal. Thank you, Hack. Uh, I don't want to leave a swell guy like you. Well, suit yourself, Eustace. 
And now, sir, as a high government official, what was the funniest thing that ever happened to you? Right now, a word or two from Tweedy Pipe Smoking Webley Webster. Really, Joe. What brings you to see us? Do you have one of your uh, penetrating book reviews this evening? Uh, no, I've been kind of goofing off recently, but I'd like to say a word or two on something real important. All right, go ahead. Well, I just uh, thought I'd remind everybody about how crowded our colleges and universities are, and they're going to get plenty worse unless everybody gives lots of support to the college of their choice. Well, it's a very sincere sentiment, Webley, and I thought all of us should heed it, but uh, don't you teach a course on the side at some college yourself? Or uh, Barber College? Barber? Barber College? Well, not a place where you learn to cut hair. Chapel found of the school was named Barber. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Boy, I sure just saw when people went there. Well, I'm glad you straightened it out. What's the course you teach there? Call how to tell the book to smell to high heaven. Well, thanks for dropping by tonight. Well, we, we'll keep you in mind, and we'll keep in mind, too, about supporting the college of our choice. You know, you can make the college of my choice, you know, too. This evening, via two-way radio, we're paying a visit to the head of one of our city's library systems, Mr. Forrest Princely, adventurer, author, and raconteur. Mr. Princely's apartment is in a quiet brownstone in New York City's pleasant East 60s, and he should be at home now. Hello, Forrest. Hello, Fred. Welcome to my humble abode. It's a real pleasure to be here. We look forward to this visit. Thank you. I wonder if you'd uh, show us around your comfortable... Well, I'd be delighted to. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that might be of interest to those who'd be looking in would be this uh, desk here. Now, the uh, former governor of Clintock of North Dakota gave this to me in 1911. Very uh, beautiful, Fred. And it's uh, Indian mahogany. Beautiful, Fred. I was going to say that uh, you're lucky to have found an apartment uh, which kind of follows your library training for being so... Well, uh, oddly enough, uh, I'd like to take you out and show you the library that I have at home. Uh, can you hear a little noise? In the... uh, we're, we're getting a little bit of it, yes. It's coming through. Well, this would probably be hard to believe, but uh, the apartment above uh, mine here has been vacant for 17 months. That's and, uh, Unfortunately, they're moving in up there on the day that uh, you pay us a visit. Certainly right. a coincidence. Did they know that uh, you were going to be on the air tonight? I couldn't hear you. I say, did they know you were going to be on the air tonight? Well, I don't think it's much of a secret. Your trucks are out front and the microphones are all over the place. Uh -huh. I, uh, I don't know uh, what they thought the, uh, all the uh, trucks would mean. Could you show us some of your favorite books that oh, you I... collected as librarian? Oh, goodness, I'm uh, terrible. Uh, well, here I have some interesting uh, first editions, uh, Fred. I have... Uh, if, uh, hold it up so you can see it. Yes. This is a... Uh, a plaster there on your shoulder. Oh. Evidently the ceiling. Oh. It's not uh, modern furniture. I have uh, airy van. More like those heavy old period pieces they're moving in. I oh, word, that's terrible. I, uh... This first edition here of Tom Sawyer. I have the uh, Hardy Brothers. I'm going to... I'm sorry, I can't right. even think. I'm, I'm, right. I'm going to crazy call, with this. this. I hope this, this isn't a omen of uh, every night the rest of my life this here. This is Morris Princely, head of oh, our city oh. library system. Our thanks for joining us, and good night. Boy. Good night, good night. Now, do we have time to... Uh, talk to Thurber. We have quite a bit of time to talk to Thurber Whitechapel in Wonderful. Chicago, and I think he, maybe he can wind up his story of the gentleman who is desirous of returning to his native uh, country, Bulgaria, and uh, experiencing the thrill of tasting some of that famous Bulgarian cream pie. He'd been shipwrecked, he'd landed in France, he was without funds, and uh, hello, Thurber, can you pick up the story uh, where he yeah, boarded the train? I think that's... Finally arrived in France, and got on the train... Uh, they had left Cherbourg, and uh, he didn't have money, didn't have any tickets, and he explained uh, to the, uh, the conductor. Well, the conductor said, uh, all right, under these circumstances, you can stay aboard. Yes. So they, uh, they stayed, and they, uh, he stayed aboard, and... Uh, the train was heading for Bulgaria. Heading for Bulgaria, and they're going up the Swiss Alps when the, uh, the train left the track. And uh, he was thrown clear, and he rolled down. Mm. And was he down? Hurt? And down. And he rolled uh, 
Oh, must have been 13 miles through snow and gravel and mm. trees and uh, brush. And uh, it's been a pretty sorry tatters, sight uh, when tatters, it landed. Uh, at the uh, foot of the uh, hill. Yes. So, uh... He had to crawl then the rest of the way, and he could see over the next hill was his native Bulgarian. At well, last, he'd he finally had a taste made it. of that wonderful Bulgarian cream pie. And that's all he could think of uh, was this pie. Sure, so, well, after uh, all this trouble, I can well imagine. He, uh, he uh, was crawling along and I'm about, oh, four or five below zero is off yeah. the cold. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of... A lot of things were happening to him, and uh, people were shooting at him. There were wild dogs and all. But finally, he reached the top of the hill, and he looked down, and uh, there was there was his native Bulgaria, and mm, there was an life. inn right at the oh, foot of this hill that where was he life. knew he could have a piece of the Bulgarian cream pie. So Wonderful. he started to uh, down the hill, and he tripped and fell and rolled some more. And fortunately, this snow slide I landed him flush up against the door of the. Uh, of the uh, tower, uh-huh. and they were right very faintly wrapped. Sure, he was door. weak. Very, very of weak. Finally, the uh, the door opened. I don't mean to be speeding you up. I just hope uh, uh, the uh, this uh, woman uh, can hear the whole story. Oh my goodness! And she helped him in oh, and fine. brought him in by a fire. And they had food there. Yeah. Well, he uh, he looked up. He said, "I know that I <laughs> I'm going to make it. I'm I'm pretty badly injured here." And uh, he said, "But I've come all the way from America. All I want is one more piece of uh, Bulgarian cream pie." And uh, she said, "Gee, we're all out of that. All we have is apple." And he said, well, that'll be all right. We've been listening to another telephonic story from Thurber Whitechapel, our correspondent in North Chicago. I believe he completed the story this evening. Well, if there's any more to it, we're not going to bother to hear. Right. That's it for now. Until tomorrow night, this is Ray Goulding reminding you to write if you get work. Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumb. Crazy, crazy, crazy. August 11th, 1959. Bob and Ray here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We thank you for making us a part of your day. Would you please thank this radio station and support their advertisers? It's their kindness and courtesy that allow us to be with you each and every time you roll around here on your favorite station. And if you miss a day, you do not have to miss a single show. Our shows are available anywhere podcasts are served, but you can find them exactly where to get them through my webpage, classicradio.stream. You can stream our shows there at classicradio.stream. You can learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can find a listing of podcast apps where our shows are available. You can contact me there. You can find uh, our social media links. You can buy me a coffee, which will help us to find brand new uh, great radio shows to bring you here on Classic Radio Theater. Thanks for listening. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station.